we're sat right now. Because people who will be watching and listening, they might just think we're in a in a very colorful house, maybe slightly old looking, but <laughs> this is one of the most iconic places in modernist architecture. Uh, we're sitting in the, uh, one of the, uh, correct my pronunciation, the Kiefhoek? Kiefhoek. Kiefhoek. Yeah, Kiefhoek. So this is the Kiefhoek Social Housing Complex, and it was designed by JJP Ode. Out, old? which translates as old. old okay, old. <laughs> you know, really, yeah, it's a Dutch word for uh, old. Oh, okay, um, and he, as you were saying before to me, he's one of the big four. So the big four being the main kind of uh, protagonists of modernist architecture: yes. Walter Gropius, Le Corbusier, JJP Oud, and Nice van der Rohe. Van der Rohe. Yeah. yeah. So this is a big deal that <laughs> I really thank you for, for, for letting us uh, use this place. Yeah, it's not my house. No, you don't live here? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, yeah, it would be, uh, this is a, a, the museum house. Mm -hmm. So all the other houses here are, um, are more up to date. This is the museum house, this, as it was, was when it was built in the um, 1930s. Or actually it's a replica of uh, the original house, but I live in a social house myself. Uh, uh, not something uh, like this, it's just a 19th, uh, end of the 19th uh, century um, apartment. Mm -hmm. um, and I live on the other side of the, of the city. Yeah. So, you know, for me, this, there was some, obviously when we spoke on the tour, one thing I was trying to understand was for something so iconic, you know, as an architecture student walking into here, I'm thinking this is like a priceless, you know, even every object I look at, every door handle, yes. you know, every pigment of paint, I'm looking at it and I'm seeing this is uh, history, but it could, all, it could also be in an exhibition. Yes. And then me trying to reconcile that with the fact that it's an everyday place of use right now, I think there was some confusion. So, for, you mean for people who... For me. For you. Yeah, for me to, to see that, you know, if you had something really precious, mm -hmm. you would almost think you want to box it up and put it in a museum. Yeah. But this is really precious, given the importance. But still, it's being used every day by yes. people. And what I was trying to understand when I spoke to you before was, uh, the, how do people get to be residents here? Um, because in my head, I'm thinking... Yeah. You have to be a millionaire to be able to live in a house like this. Yeah. But it's still... No, it's the people with the lowest incomes who wow. can rent social housing. But you have, what you have to understand is this was um, designed in 1925 and it was finished 1930 and then people moved in. Uh, this was also a sort of experiment. This was as, uh, at, the, um, um, yeah, at the start of the whole socialist era. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, there were so many people who had, didn't have like a safe roof over their, their heads, uh, especially people with low income. Mm. And this um, this area where we're at now, were uh, about three hundred houses who were built for that were built for people uh, uh, for for large families, uh, low income families with uh, six or maybe seven children. And um, um, so social social housing was. Um, it, it was necessary. And th the thing is that J.P. Out, who worked for the first social housing department, he had his own ideas. With another architect, this would never have happened. Yeah. And J.P. Out knew how important it was to do it differently. But the ordinary people and the people in the city council, they didn't appreciate back then how important it was. He was appreciated amongst his peers, but not so much. Um, no, in the like the lay people, yeah, yeah, general public, because it was kind of outside of the norm, yeah. right? I think that was the thing with most modernist buildings that people were like, yeah, this is weird, exactly. yeah. And you know, in the 1980s, uh, this was in a really bad condition, so this whole area has been reconstructed, and um, sorry, that's okay. Uh, the whole area was reconstructed. But early 1980s, this whole modern movement was uh, no longer appreciated. And, you know, um, people who, know, who knew about, about uh, architecture started reappreciating it. But the 
your general public didn't get it, the, the city council didn't get it. And so what happened here was um, they did a renovation and they put in these white plastic windows <laughs> and you did, did a really sober renovation, even thought about maybe would be better to just demolish it and build something new. And it was only very coinc coincidentally that this was right at the period when his work started to be popular. started to become popular again. And then it was decided to just yeah to first try and save it, which wasn't possible, and then to completely reconstruct it. So the people who lived here all these decades before simply could return back to this amazing museum-like area. That's incredible. Yes. That to me is one of the most surreal things about this because, like I said, I feel that this should be you know. If you had millionaire artists, yeah. they would pay big money to yes. live in a house like this, yes. just because of the sheer. And and that is something which really appeals to me that this is part of iconic houses, you know. Um, what do iconic houses? Well, iconic houses is an organization that um, that, uh, um, that open up uh, ar uh, architects' houses to the public. So. If someone lives in a house by an architect, but just lives there and doesn't open it up, it doesn't end up on Iconic Houses yes. uh, platform, but um, a museum house like this does. And this is I've probably, I think, the only social housing. For the rest, it's these villas and, you know, the, the fancy. And the weird thing is that if you, um, some decades ago, if you looked at these beautiful modernist villas, mm -hmm. It was like the, the artistic people who would think, oh, I would love to own a house like that. And exactly. then it got bought up by people who didn't appreciate it at all. Sometimes just bulldozed it down, built something new. And that's, yeah, that's so amazing. You look out the window yes, and it's, exactly. if he was alive today, he'd be proud. It's still serving yeah. its purpose. Uh, because it, that tends to happen with people who, you know, their work after they die, suddenly it goes into an even more kind of, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, luxury realm, but yeah. this has stayed humble. And and they could have decided to turn them into more luxury exactly. apartments and ask a lot of rent for it. So for this to be preserved the way it was intended for low-income people, yeah. that's wonderful. Amazing. So I think that kind of brings us onto your background in a way. So how did you actually become passionate about this and get involved in in, in something like this um, in what you do essentially because you, you you try to bring awareness uh, to 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 this particular story if you like yes. the the social housing the JJP because I assume you take a lot of pride in this I do I, well I, well pride is not exactly the right word I'm really happy when people see places like this with a, you know new a new insight. Um, um, I'm yeah, pr proud, proud is a, but but I think it's so important, and I'm so passionate about it, and I, mm -hmm. I, I really would want people to, but look at it and hear the stories yeah. and try and understand why it's. This is not about finding something beautiful or ugly. This is about an, a, a different kind of value. Uh, uh, it's an important. There's an importance yeah. and a story that has to be conveyed in a way. Yeah. The story has to be told. And from your background, as a, I, I remember you say you, were, you did interior architecture, you're also an artist. Yeah, I, yeah, I started out as an artist. Well, actually, I started out for a few years studying fashion design. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then um, switched, uh, moved to Rotterdam, switched to monumental design mixed media. So I started out as an artist, which, yeah, the, the whole conceptual idea of looking at the world is, that's... Like so one of the big things in the in the um, uh, at the uh, art academy in in Rotterdam, um, and um, and then I uh, I worked as a, a set designer, <laughs> started even started doing um, started playing theater myself to understand how it was for the actors to move around in my stages. So I always want to know what I what it's for. I want to uh, to uh, understand or feel what the people need who I'm doing something for. So that's... Almost I, the psychology of the, yes. of the user. Yeah. yeah. Because I can, I can um, design something that is really beautiful. 
but it's like in all these slick pictures of architecture you, you always see, you know, oh, something new. And then they leave, they always leave out the people. And I find that so weird. It, it's not a sculpture, it's not a work of art, it's meant to be used. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, then I moved to uh, interior design and I worked for architectural companies and I, I realized that I'm, I mean, I'm, I'll be the first to admit I'm a really mediocre designer, but I'm really good at doing re research and, and making something come to life. And so that's what I love the most. So then at the architectural studios I worked for, and then we got an assignment. And then I wanted to know, but what, what, what kind of company is this? Um, what kind of building do they live in? What is the history of it? So I always wanted to know the story behind it and somehow... Even when I had my own design studio, that is the thing I loved most. So have you heard of uh, Jan Gael? No. So he's a Danish urban designer and your, the ideas you're talking about are very similar to what he's talking about. And he's one of the most prominent urban designers of our time today. And that was the idea that hu people have forgotten about the human scale. Yeah. And uh, it's actually really interesting hearing you talk about that because... Uh, what what time were you starting to have these ideas, or at least what 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 year do you think it was when you were uh, when it started to change? No. When when you started to become interested in design itself, but also th and the aspect of design that's concerned with humans specifically, because you say yeah. you weren't a you were a mediocre designer, yeah. but you were always interested. I, in I I I well with hindsight. I expect I have always had that, wow. but it never developed somehow. And it only developed when I started to get involved in theater, mm -hmm. because once you start, when, when you've done art academy and you, you get involved in theater, somehow the artists think you're okay. Now you belong in another box. Mm -hmm. And for me, it doesn't matter. It's just, it's a medium you use. You can use film or paint or bricks or whatever. It's just the medium you use to, um, to um, convey to the world what you want to, what you want to tell them. And so I'm keep, I keep switching, <laughs> you know, that's what's happening. And I always felt, thought, oh, I, you know, when is it going to happen? Because we have this saying in Holland, you have 12 profession and 13, um, 13 disasters you know and that's what i always thought so oh i've all already used 12 of my professions and i still haven't but now i know it all falls into place everything falls in everything i've done every and it's always it's it's about people or about living things can be animals as well but it's about yeah life it's all about life <laughs> that's so, amazing you know you just said uh you kind of mentioned that, that there's a mixed media approach yeah. to conveying a design narrative and for me that is an incredible way of putting it because uh, you know in terms of how you say you you, you said you did you could be acting it could be a brick it could be yeah. uh, it could be anything anything or any type of media to, to convey the, the sort of design narrative i think that's so powerful and what i will say to you and you know i've done a few conversations with some designers <laughs> and you know, maybe I am the next generation of designers, if you like. But what we're seeing now is this new acceptance of how to represent design or, or, or and, and even, you know, when design becomes implemented, what different ways you can present it, not just by a specific, you know, particular drawing yeah. or, you know, some CAD drawn thing. Now people are becoming more in tune with a much more uh, what they call multimodal way of, 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 of conveying design. Yeah. And I think it's because, you know, given the history of, you know, drawing and illustration and architecture, we've gone through different periods of, you know, hand drawing to CAD drawing. And I think now we might be going to an even more creative way. Yeah. So. I always hope there's going to be a chip that you can put in your head that will store all, all your thoughts. Yeah. And then some, yeah, how you can beam Right. Get, because that's what, what what I find so frustrating. What's going on in my head is so much quicker and so much more than what's what I'm able to. So that would be a great thing. And then we could all use this, plug into each other's yeah. whole. Yeah. Now that you say that, that, that would be a perfect form of internet. But yeah. but if you could allow people to 
Yeah, you need consent. Yeah, guys. You, yeah. Need consent <laughs> you can't just plug into anyone. <laughs> but no, but I, that, that's I, I, at its essence. That's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. As an artist or designer, yeah. your job is to convey your vision. Yeah. And the medium in which you convey your vision is, you know, like we said, it was in architecture. It was to, through drawing, model making. Then we had technological revolution and now we're doing it on CAD and yeah. vision. Are we then actually, the argument could be that we're coming away from a more genuine representation. I think we're going away from material yeah. representation. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not. It's no, I think it's a logical result of this over-consumerism. And I, for, because that's, you know, I, uh, I don't design anymore. I don't feel the need to design anymore at all. And and at some point, about 12 years ago, I had already started doing, uh, uh, started blogging about the things that I saw that I thought were relevant. And I started to showing people around, but look at this and hear the story of this. And it was before I became a professional guide and guide is by l uh, lack of a better uh, word. But um, for me, somehow... Um, especially being quite a mediocre designer, adding material stuff to the world was, it's, I stopped wanting to add to the world. I thought I have no relevant things to add to the world material-wise, but I do have value to add to the world story-wise. So that's why I started doing it, and that's why I love it so much. What I, that's uh, an incredible thing to say, because so, it makes me think, actually, uh, personally myself, I'm actually more interested in the reappropriation of materials or the reuse or the upcycling of materials. Because I know it's kind of a separate conversation, but in terms of design, I almost have a level of anxiety to, to, to yeah. make a new build. <laughs> and I'm currently doing my master's at the moment. And my tutor is saying, well, why, why don't you just make a, a new build? I'm like, yeah. I, I'd rather reuse something yeah. old. Yes, that's yeah. what. Yeah, and yeah. that's what I've always. That's what I've always done as well. I, I, I preferably wear secondhand clothes. I, um, my house is filled with secondhand furniture. Um, this, this whole urge to have something new, I find such a waste. And 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 the, the, when I did art school, and I um, in 1989, I did my. Um, final project you know yeah. before graduation and there was i built a bridge from reclaimed floorboards and wow. and, and it ended up i didn't the i know i, I you know I sh, I, I sh, i've shown it and then it i, I sorted back into pieces and they ended up in the stone in the uh, how do you call it the, the kachel what, what do you Storm call it the stone no the Oh, the, fi the, the, fireplace. the fireplace. The fireplace. Yeah. Oh, you the, used it as kindling. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, for the for the studio I was working because it got so cold in winter. So you turned was, your bridge into a source of yes, heat and comfort. So I, I turned it back into a source of fuel. Mm -hmm. So that's it had all these, and that's what I love when something has all these layers of lives that it's lived, and materials also have that and can have that. If you reuse materials, there is an intrinsic story in the material as well um, and you can see it but maybe you can you can feel it just like you knew you had to buy a yellow sweater but maybe that's i'm not and i'm not i'm, I'm, I'm a really earthy person <laughs> you know but somehow there is there is something you can grab but it is it's the ephemeral you know the, the, ephemeral, the yeah. next but you know What's interesting is we're talking about all these, uh, if you like, almost contemporary ideas. We're living in the year 2020 now. And, but we're sitting in a house uh, where people were, you know, the big four, if you like, these modernist thinkers. And we appreciate this house, don't we? But the people who were here, they had very different ideas. The new yeah. was important to them. Reappropriation, yes. upcycling, and yes. recycling was not. And that's something that's something that we forget. It is a luxury to be able to do um, durable things or uh, environmentally uh, friendly uh, things, because it, you you also see it in an area like this. Um, if you see the old pictures, there's no cars, obviously, because there were only a few cars and rich people owned the car. And so the, these streets are all empty and people, the children could play in the streets. But if you walk around here now, the, the rent is low, but the cars are big. Because that, you know, the cars are the thing that 
make you, they, it makes you somebody. And so, um, yeah, new is important to people who don't have much. You know, it's almost like, because I was saying about the Yang Gale uh, guy I was telling you about, he also, his main kind of principle is that cars are kind of what caused the dehumanist scale to be born. Because when we designed for cities for cars, we started to design in a scale that was way too large because the speed of the car would allow us to go from city to city. And, but that's not really how humans operate. Yeah. So what you ended up with was a city full of roads yeah. <laughs> and not streets and not you yeah. know the human scale. But when, you know, I've been here for a couple of days now in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, the streets have been given priority. And I think yes. because in your part of the world, you know, you know Norway and Denmark and these places, yeah, pedestrianization and these ideas, you're a lot further ahead than the rest of us. Yeah. Um, but that's what I mean in terms of the, the modernist style. It, was, uh, it wasn't that they didn't want to prioritize people, but uh, the, the, the urgency and the, the kind of uh, um, the, the feeling, the impulse they had to be new to be radical thinkers. Yes. And a part of the modernist philosophy is to is to not draw on the past. Yes. Do not use yeah, historical. A radical, a radical new uh, design. Yeah, as, yeah, and Out was involved in the style okay. also in his earlier years. So people like Mondrian and Theo van Doesburg. And um, this, 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 um, this magazine they had where they wrote about new the new art, which would and all other forms of art and was not a style, but was a, a new fundamental way of dealing with the world. And this, it's... Um, um, and that's what they called the style. That it's called the style. It's this movement called the style. And, um, uh, and, and if you look outside to the houses here, you know, the, 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 yellow, uh, the yellow windows, the, 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 the broad band of yellow windows and the red doors and the blue... Um, the blue uh, gates mm. um, um, and the white, the white plastered uh, facades. It's all. It's as if you're looking at a Mondrian painting. And that, but there's another thing you just mentioned: cars. And did you know that outset? He he wanted this so much. He wanted so much to experiment with this neighborhood because his goal was to eventually be able to make a house like a tea fort. Like a what for? A T Ford. What's that? You know, that's the first mass produced car. Oh, the, the Model T Ford. Model yeah, yeah. T Ford. So that was his his aim was to be able to produce a house. And it's a bit like now we can print three D print houses. He would have loved that, yeah. I guess, that <laughs> idea. But that was his aim. And I mean, these are brick houses, and they're plastered to look like they're machine made. But the whole thing that this this the the industry industrial um not only um, um, I mean it, that it could serve people and that it could serve designers to make things that were much easier to make than and so it would become available to everybody that was that was the idea of the time of mass production if we think of mass production now we think of the downsides but in those days it was a way to Make um, make cheaper things for as many people as yeah. possible that were still beautiful and durable. It's a it's a, it's a it's a really interesting kind of irony uh, here being played though because, like you said, people associate you know mass production and and these kind of uh, you know over industrialized systems as extremely negative. Yeah. But in some ways, there's there was almost a socialist aspect to it. Yes. That you would kind of almost democratize yeah. something so that everybody could have the same version. Yeah. It ne ne needed to be beneficiary for everybody, from factory owner to factory uh, laborer, and, and for for for, um, for housewives. That was a big thing, doing some something for housewives to make their wife their, their life uh, easier, and so the prefab all, kitchen. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, um, for instance, having a kitchen, which is, uh, it's really, really tiny, mm -hmm. but it was quite comfortable to work in. And, and Out was also, Out also made, um, uh, in the Weissenhof Siedlung in, in Stuttgart, you, in 1927, you had this experiment where all these international modernist architects 
um, built, it's still there, you know, um, they built a small row or block of houses which they thought would be the future houses for the lower classes. Mm -hmm. And it's all very modernist and it's slick and white. I'll build a block of houses there. He was the only one to employ a female architect to help him design the kitchen. Because she, as a woman, would know <laughs> what was needed. Amazing. Yeah. That's really interesting because then he's using the, uh, in essence, it is pure functionalism in a way because yeah. you're you're designing and uh, we you know I recently visited the Schroeder house by yeah, by yeah. Gerrit Rietveld and that's and that's a sculpture right but then you suddenly you walking through the city you start to feel there's a network of these kind of digital nodes yes. you know and you have all these kind of big dutch thinkers and designers who are was Mondrian? Where was he? Yes, Mondrian was was one of the he people of the style. He was Dutch. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so you got all these big yeah. kingpins of, of of the style movement, and uh, and 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 you walk around. You can almost make a map of this. Yes, there is a map of it. There's a book of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, but they, but you have to remember that this it's it's so important to like try and travel back in time and and to experiences. Um, it's the way the people would have experienced it then, because this was the time, I mean, second, the, the First World War was just ending and everybody knew this should never happen, happen again. Um, the whole class differences were becoming, you know, the, the, um, debatable. Yeah. Should there be so much difference between people? And um, uh, it was the time of the, in, 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 in England as well, you know, the suffragettes in Holland, 1917 laborers got voting rights, 1919 women got voting rights. Uh, it was the, the time of the unions of all the architects who, after the revolution in Russia, thought, this is where we want to go because we want to really be able to build a new world. And it was a time of optimism and positivity. And I knew, you know, after the crash of 1929, this, yeah. it all, you, you got the, mm -hmm. again, the nationalism and the, so it was only a really short, very vibrant period, very turbulent period where everybody body, body, body got together and all over the world, separate architects and philosophers and business owners, they all felt this same mm -hmm. tremble and they, they managed to connect, and that's I think is the important thing. They managed to meet up, write each other letters, organize symposia. So they, if they hadn't done that, we need to, nothing would have happened. Yeah. So it's it yeah it's so much and it's so ironic because the style is called the style. Yeah. But I think after actually after um, uh, uh, since the style. We, we don't have styles any longer. We have movements. So yeah. Style is so much, as I say, if it's about the shape. And it's not about the shape. It's, a, it's about the whole... Everything oh. else, yeah. Yeah, everything the else. The life, yeah. like you said. I'm, 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 I'm thinking of all these Dutch words, but I don't yeah. know how to translate them in English. Well, so, uh, you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I mean, it's kind of like we're touching on now that uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about almost a brief kind of history, almost a chronology of, obviously, pre-World War One. there was, uh, sorry, post-World War One. there was a kind of a new template for, let's, a, a kind of a blank slate, if you like, yeah. for new ideas. And I guess, you know, if people were to criticize, uh, you know, the, the modernist philosophy of not using anything from the past, uh, this is a, a good excuse would be, you know, world, two world wars. Yes. <laughs> that, of course, they had to come up with something new. Yeah. So it, what I'd like to kind of know is almost a brief history of how this, this style, be, you know, became a thing. Who was the main protagonist? And um, the main person was called Theo van Doesburg. And he was actually... I'm not sure he'd be the man you want to be talking to in an interview because uh, yeah, apparently he wasn't the most easy person to work with. But um, he was, um, uh, um, yeah, he started this magazine called The Style. And um, by the way, The Style just means the style. The style the yeah. the, and it was The Style because this was meant to be The Style, The Style that would end all. Capital T. That's it. <laughs> 
yeah, this was nothing else but the style. This was the new way forward. Wow. And after that, nothing else would happen. So he was a bit, you know, you can understand what kind of person he was. Yeah. But, um, uh, and for him, this was all about art. I, I, he wasn't people's art uh, designer. He wasn't people's architect. So for him, this was all about, this was very theoretical. This was all very theoretical. But somehow, in what he described... And he also, in his little magazine you could su subscribe to, he also, he wrote about other things happening in other countries, interviews with other people. So there, somehow there, there were similarities. It's what, that's, I think, what the magazine did. It made, the, ma the magazine made it possible for other designer, other uh, art, artists, architects to get notice of these new kind of ideas and then they could add by writing an article themselves or by describing something they had seen and so uh, it this this is this gradually evolved into um new rules yeah. <laughs> it would end all, it was meant to end all rules right. but it came up with new rules and so the new rules were you can only use geometric shapes yeah. you can only use lines and um, rectangles um, you can only um, use uh, primary the primary colors red, uh, yellow, blue, uh, and you can use white, gray, and black. So he set these rules. Well, it's I'm not sure if he he was the most dogmatic uh, of them, uh, but somehow it fitted into. I don't know. It's it, usually when something new happens, it's not one person who. It's because you had. Um, in, in Germany, there were also a lot of artists who had experimented. And, and you know, people like um, like the the, um, the Russian, the Russian uh, constructivist artists, um, people like um, uh, oh, what's his name, the the, the Black Square. Uh, you know what I mean? Oh, what's his name, Malevich, the the oh, Russian Malevich, uh, Malevich. I don't. Yeah. So. Everywhere there were people who tried to get rid of ornaments and tried to get rid of yes. um, uh, um, like decorative aesthetics and try to come to an essence of and and you know the, the like the, the 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 lines and the rectangles and the colors. This was the age of the car and of the of the, of the fast chips and of the te telegraph posts and of the you know of the tech this whole technical aspect yeah, yeah. is. It's what you see, and I, I mean, it's what in Rotterdam, uh, for instance. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure where the others live, but uh, in Rotterdam, this new movement became really big because we didn't have this aesthetic history like they had in Amsterdam, for instance. Right. So Amsterdam did totally different thing with de decorative brick buildings for uh, laborers, for instance. But in Holland, we had these young business owners, these international, um, uh, these people with international acquaintances who'd seen the world, who were interested in art, were interested in yoga and vegetarianism and, mm -hmm. you know, all of it. It's like they, they were almost, yeah, they were almost people like us. Wow, they were ahead of their time. They were so ahead of, the, of their time. They meditated and they, they yeah. And so Theo, Theo von uh, Theo von Duisburg. Von Duisburg. He was a kind of senior to. Uh, yeah, he was like the one who started it. Some, well, not him on his own. I think he started with some someone called Phil Filmos Huzar, but I don't know how you pronounce that. So they started with the two of them, but it, you know, it involved other people. And so yeah. out, it was one of the people who thought this might apply to architecture as well. Of course, and that's it. It's, it's like, you're right that these art movements are they're very natural to kind of human yeah, as human civilization, you know evolves so too do art yeah. art movements and it's not as if he came up with this set no. in stone he wasn't like uh, the the uh you know the scientologist movement yeah. coming up with a whole new set of principles but he was he kind of carried through and reinterpreted yes. an art movement into a more architectural uh, you know. I, that's what i did because Theo von Duisburg, right. he was more the um, he was more the the, the the conceptual one so was he artist by trade or was he i think so yeah. i'm I have to tell you, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, I'm trying to go quite but, far uh, back. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Out was an art.
architect and he thought, oh, these new principles, they might apply to architecture. And Out himself started out with, um, there's two famous things that are, have been rebuilt in the 1980s when there came a reappreciation. One of is, is um, like, a, how do you say this, a, like a, a construction shed that was used to, um, you know, this this shed you have on site for the people who look at the drawings and try to right. manage the work, the, the direction management yeah. shed, um, which is a bit like what you mentioned, the Rietveld Schroeder House, which oh. is almost like a abstract mm. artwork. <laughs> um, and he also did a facade for a cafe called Café de Uni, which has also been reconstructed in another side of the city, uh, another part of the city then. Uh, formally, but this was like one big commercial. It was the. Uh, I think I'm staying opposite the Udi. You you are. It's at West Singel. Yeah, I'm on West Singel. You yeah you are because then you see the rec oh. reconstruction of this uh, facade. Wow. Yeah, we keep walking past it. Yeah. I'm gonna go take a. Yeah, you have to take a closer look because but but because he said yeah oh and everybody is ha having these really ugly um, um, commercials. Um, just screwed onto their shop facade. So better to turn the whole facade into one big commercial. So, you know, this is Café de Uni. Um, but he came away from that. Later, he broke a bit with the style because he said, well, architecture is not art. And architecture is, it needs something different. I mean, people live in architecture. Architecture has a... Um, a human element. A human element. It's almost as if, Theo von Duisburg. Duisburg. <laughs> it's hard to remember these names. Uh, had he would almost have a conflict with Aud's ideas. They, yeah, Duisburg. Theo von Duisburg had conflicts with everybody. He but, did. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. it's strange that it's a similar movement, but yeah. Aud kind of made it more humanist. Well, uh, you know, you had the style, which that was the starting point, but very soon after, um, people, the, the the designers, so those involved with making something that needs to be used, like architects, they, they it's like they, they separated into another path, and that is the uh, movement we call Nieuwe Bau, a new building in Holland. And so... Um, that's the functionalist style. That's the functionalist style. So from this initial style, and you know, you know there were several things going on at the same time, so... The style was more the artistic movement, right. and uh, and it yeah another branch developed into what we call new building. But both the style and out had a huge influence on Bauhaus. That's the next thing I was going to yeah, say. Huge influence yeah. on Bauhaus. So then, how did that carry through into the Bauhaus? Well, Bauhaus, uh, when they started, what they wanted was um, you know they, you had all these industrially. Um, produced items that were not pretty at all. That was just mass produced. You could use it was usable, but it was um, just yeah, no more than that. And what they wanted to do at Bauhaus was to um, make things that were um, produced by machines, but would have design value or uh, uh, um, yeah, it, yeah. They weren't just plain kind yeah. of industrial. Thing. But they, but it started out a bit more like an arts and crafts school, like you have the arts and crafts movement, movement in uh, in England, and then under the influence of people like Out and but there were a lot of uh, other Dutch designers, people like Piet Zwart and also J. P. Out. They started giving guest tutorials at Bauhaus, and so they introduced these ideas of the style. And Theo van Doesburg, he wants to to become a tutor at Bauhaus, but they only asked him for this guest uh, uh, tutorial. Um, he didn't like it. <laughs> but, um, but, the, but the students were really, inf especially the students, they were so much influenced by these new ideas. And then also Bauhaus also started to think maybe we should use uh, focus more on mass-produced items. Beautiful, usable, mass-produced items for everybody and so there was yeah he was a uh, out was was influential uh, hugely for what happened yes. i mean if people who know about Bauhaus, they, yeah. they they should know 
Yeah. Oh, it's, it's funny behind that. Yeah, it's funny because then people come to Rotterdam. You show them this like vanilla world heritage. I don't know if you visited uh, this as well. The no. factory that you visited. No. Okay. This huge factory, it's world heritage. Um, Is it the floating one? No, no, no. It's a glass palace, like f- from um, also from the same period as this. Yeah. You've um, got to give me the reference after. Yeah. I can go uh, so, yeah, you need to look it up because this is all, you know, it's all happening at the same time. So, what is it called again? Vanilla Factory. It's, uh, and, and, um, uh, so people come down from all over the world to see this mm. and then. People in Rot- some people in Rotterdam don't even know it exists. Wow, yeah. <laughs> and, and and also then you say, yeah, it's the it's the the, the most um, amazing example of Nieuwe Bauer, of new building. And uh, they say, no, I've never heard of it. And they say, you know Bauhaus? Yeah, they've heard of Bauhaus. Oh, but wow. the funny thing is, that, you know, actually Bauhaus is influenced by these... Uh, they need to know their yeah. own culture better. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's weird that Bauhaus has... But obviously Bauhaus was, because it was a school and because um, there's so much, it's, uh, oh, how do you call it? How do you say this? They were an institution. Yeah, they were an institution. So they had much more yes. power, if you like, yeah. to, to spread the message. In a way. Yeah. And J- JP was, he was a, he was a single man and, yeah. you know, he, uh, not single, I said he was, it was just one person yeah. kind of. Yeah, and, and, ideas. and it's just that there's a sort of coincidence that he, got involved with this new, this first yeah. um, uh, social housing uh, yeah. department at a time when he was ready for this and was just he's getting young. involved in the style. I've, he's from 1890, I think he's born 1890. And he, I think he started working there at tw- in uh, 1916, so he must have been 26. <laughs> so yeah, really, really young. Yeah. So it's a coincidence. It's coincidence that this happened and he was able to do this because there was and I uh, you call it an alderman I think so in between the city council and the mayor is there is that called an, what do you call uh, or maybe you don't have an I mean, we take permission from the council to do some building council. work yeah anyway so this was the um, for the first time we there was someone with um, power in the Dutch uh, sorry, in the Rotterdam Council, who really um, stood up for the, the sort of things that Out wanted. So everything came together. Otherwise, it wouldn't have yeah. happened like this. And it only lasted this this period of social housing, where the, the government got involved and helped pay so that the rent would be something that people could afford. Otherwise, it would have been too expensive. So um, this only lasted for a few few years. Mm-hmm. That ended mid nineteen twenties, mm-hmm. when out designed this. I mean, this was the last thing that was realized, that was really built. Man, it, but it was every, it was everything aligned for this to happen, and then yeah, it, everything it's was preserved now. It's yeah. So that's actually the kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about is the context and the people and the life of of people in Rotterdam at the time. Like you were saying that, you know, everything was kind of coming into place for something of this sort to exist. And one of those things uh, was immigration, right? There was a kind of a new wave of immigration into Rotterdam. Yes. And that had happened since the end of the 20th century. Um, because Rotterdam was, wasn't a big city. I think it had about 125,000 residents so mid-19th century. It wasn't really, it wasn't important in any way, but because there were possibilities to expand the harbor, it meant that you needed people to come work in the harbor. And and at that time, uh, so many, uh, especially farmers in rural areas in Holland were so impoverished and this, their crops um, failed year after year. And they were, you, you know, those were the people who came to Rotterdam. Um, to work here and they needed to be housed. So from the end of the 19th century onwards, Rotterdam started expanding and building, but first like only private initiative. And um, yeah, you need to house them somewhere. So the government acknowledged that, you know, we have a new wave of workers coming in, they're gonna feed into our economy. So we need to give them housing and essentially social housing is 
you know, the, the government will make affordable housing yes. uh, for people who can uh, you know, use that. But what an amazing uh, yeah. architect they got. Yeah, but that, yeah, but that's only, that only happened, you know, from 1916 onwards. Right. But in the, the last part of the 19th century, it was all private initiative. Right. So, and then the, gov- the, the city council said, well, you need to follow certain rules uh, because uh, otherwise you won't get uh, water or a sewage. Right. You won't connect you to the water or to the sewage, but that was about the only thing they could do. But um, um, at, at the beginning of the 20th century, there, was, uh, there were so many people who needed houses that the government said, okay, now you know, and it was the right time. It was just, it just it was the right time. And so they finally decided this is not a private a responsibility. This sure. is, um, yeah, it's government's yeah. responsibility. Amazing. Yeah. And uh, it's it's largely due to, in a way, that this was, a, like you were saying, the political landscape had allowed for this to happen for a very short period of time yeah. and suddenly it worked. It's... You know, one of the things that really stands out to me, and I'm going to be taking it back for inspiration for my project in design, is this kind of large-scale urban vision, because this is a huge complex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how many houses are here right here now? Here in this little area, just where, just where we are now, this is this, these were 290 houses. And they were initially 290 houses. Were they, initially they were initially 290, and after reconstruction, uh, it's about 190. So, yeah. so they've actually doubled the space. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, what happened uh, was they became they were did they become destroyed or they just slowly started to deteriorate? Well, the biggest problem was that to keep them cheap and affordable, one of the things they decided back then to make it cheaper was to not use foundation poles but use concrete slabs on which they would build them but this is polder ground and so very soon after this was built it started sagging and cracks started to appear because of the soil because of the soil because it keeps moving and so in the 1980s they did the um, yeah when they did 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 it up (laughs) some of the houses that were in really bad condition they were damp and you know and Uh, They did them up with the plastic windows and uh, and everything. And... um, But they did it perfectly to what, you know, perfect... No, no, but that was before. That was the first. uh, Yeah, there was a... Some houses, you know, you had to do something. (laughs) But this was in a period... It was the same period I moved to Rotterdam. And I was so astonished that Rotterdam is always, always uh, demolishing and building. Always. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I want to chain myself to some of the buildings. <laughs> yeah. Say, but look at that. Please wait a few years before you really appreciate it, before you build it. Uh, but yeah, luckily, ex- as in the, these 1980s, there came this reappreciation. And then the government thought, well, this is special. Let's find out if we can renovate it. And then the bureau said, no, renovation, it's, it's not possible. So, and then they start, decided to rebuild it. <laughs> and it was reconstructed, right? It was completely reconstructed. This this house as well, it's completely reconstructed. I mean, it could be argued that, you know, although what we're sitting in... What year was this reconstructed? Um, I think it was finished 1995. Oh, so you had yeah. a small... Yeah, you had a first renovation in the 1980s. And then at the right time, <laughs> exactly, you know. It, one year earlier, well, it could have been demolished. And just something else built. So it was just the right time for the reappreciation with the rebuilding of the facade of the uni and so. Um, but, but yeah, I think it was 1995. But you know, it has been reconstructed the, the, from the outside. The facades have been reconstruction. The whole idea has been reconstruction. The whole layout, because you cannot just rebuild this one museum house. You need, it is the the urban plan of this that is so smart, you know, because you feel as if you're in a village in a big town. And that was also a thing that Out said. He says, if you build for the future, you cannot build separate single houses. You need to use building blocks. You, ne- you need to have this communal um, li- uh, living area. And also you need to be able to get away from the hustle and bustle of your job and your daily life and the traffic and everything. So... 
It's yeah. It's almost like it's a like you have your in England you have your garden villages. Yeah. You know that this is the Dutch equivalent yeah. of a garden village. Yeah. You create your own little microcosm, your community. Yes. And one thing I, I'm starting to realize that I'm, as I'm looking at the the master plan behind you as well on the wall, uh, yeah. it's it is this kind of mini city in a yes, way, this mini town, city. and by the by the choice to create you know connected houses and i know we have terraced housing in the uk and everything as well but these this is more than that this is every house is kind of almost touching each other yes uh, it does give you a level of adaptability as well yes. because they can be combined you can that's what happened in the reconstruction exactly. so the, the facades are kept the same the whole f- when you walk outside you are you you're traveling a bit back in time mm-hmm. apart from all the cars that are there but inside it's just been modern uh, modernized it's uh, been updated it's so it's yeah. like you know uh, our studio right now is exploring the concept of adaptable architecture one thing i'm just realizing this is why i love doing podcasts by the way because yeah. i learn so much from people like you you know i could almost call this static adaptability because you don't have to move something Yes. You don't have to tear the house down and put it on wheels so it can rotate yeah. out. But just by the mere fact that there's a space next to it that can be reappropriated, yeah. you've adapted that space yeah. to be bigger, smaller, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. And, you know, the big thing here is that because it is standardized, because this is almost like a product, a house like a product, once you start renovating or reconstructing, you can do every house in the same way it makes it that also makes it easier it's not just the building of something like this that's cheaper it's all the also the maintenance and the renovation that makes it cheaper and we have to remember this these ideas in the time that they were being you know uh, created would be alien to those people at the time yeah. that someone is going to make a mass produced yeah, uh, you know it uh, it's 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 science fiction exactly and you know people you know in our time we can be quick to find problems or criticisms of it but like you said if you know the context and you know the story and yeah. you know the time really try to know what the time is yeah. you'll realize how incredibly revolutionary these yes. ideas were and and how ahead of their time they were yeah. And I think when you frame yourself, uh, frame your understanding of a project like this in the context it was in, you can then start to think of those same principles and how you can apply yeah. it to today. Okay, and you have to understand that um, a lot of these families um, had to slave day in, day out. They had no no free time. They some. A lot of these people lived, if they lived in the city centers, there were a lot of slums where they lived like 25 square meters, one room where they had to do everything and it was damp and they paid too much rent to a private owner and they uh, they they got ill and their children died uh, before they even matured, you know, and there was, there was so much going on. And so there was something really needed to be done. It something it was it's, it was so urgent, yeah. um, so um, for these people and also in other in in the nineteenth century uh, privately built apartments, the, those were these very long you know next to each yeah. other all these uh, small houses with only a, a window on one side and the other side and then a, a staircase which led to all the different floors that were rented out and then people slept in the middle in like these locked up bedrooms without fresh air. And so that was also a problem. So, okay. um, and, and the, fun, the, the funny thing is, it was not only the socialists, it was the, like the Christian parties as well. They said, yeah, but in these, uh, these uh, small houses where people have to sleep all in the center of this room, yeah then children can hear their parents have sex. Yeah. With them. So that for them was really important to say, okay, let's go ahead and do yeah. things like this, where the boys and the girls and the parents have their separate bedrooms. And so that also helped. So it's a, we, we take this for granted that we have yeah. separate rooms, but yeah. it's, it's not that no, old it's, of an idea. It's really not that old. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is, even toilets were luxuries, right? Yes. A toilet, no, but to have your, as a family, to have your own, your own toilet. toilet. Well, um, 
the small houses, 19th century houses, they had their own toilets, yes. so they had this. But the slums in the city center, sometimes you had to use with four or five families and you, all these children, and you had to use one loo. So that could be, you know, dozens of people using one loo, so to have your own loo. And they had actually wanted to have a shower as well, but that was too expensive. Yeah, so they actually didn't fit a few of the things in. That would have been so luxurious. Because yeah, nobody, no laborer had a shower. Exactly. And already this is, you know, when you, when, again, we're now understanding the context that this was built for the almost the lowest yes. class, yeah. if you like, the people who were in, almost in poverty. Um, yeah, and you had to be of unspoken behavior. Uh -huh. um, so there it wasn't was just anyone who could get No, it wasn't just anyone. You had to be of unspoken behavior and you had to also allow the social worker to come in your house and look in your pants, what you were cooking and look in your cupboard, how you had folded the sheets and you needed to be, you know, civilized. In some ways, it, it almost was, it, it was much bigger than just the social housing. It was, yeah. it was a, almost a government initiative to even rehabilitate. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And if we look at it from our perspective, that's what we see. We see a very patronizing government that tries to control people's lives. But at the same time, there was also, um, you know, it, it, everything in this period has two sides. <laughs> so they want, you want to help the poor people, but it also needs to be for your own benefit. So... It's better when people are educated and uh, healthy and, uh, you know. You know, the one thing that really stood out to me when I came here, uh, apart from, I mean, it kind of is connected to me saying, you know, it's, there's almost a timelessness to this, that people are still using it as social housing, uh, almost a century later, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but some of these people may have been here when it was first up and they're still here. Yeah. No, well, not the exact same. Or their children. Their yeah, yeah. But um, uh, I, I, I've spoken to some of the residents, mm -hmm. sometimes when I uh, do tour, and then you speak to the residents, and some of them, their grandparents mm -hmm. started out here, mm -hmm. and then the children wanted to stay here as well, because this is, a, it's also a community, much more then than it would be now. I mean, in those days, yeah. everybody went out to the, to the same two shops and to the water, the, the boiler um, um, boiler house to get their, their hot water and they, and they would meet in the streets. So that has changed. But there are people who, yeah, it's families incredible. who have, yeah. And it's almost like, you know, you're talking about your bridge that you broke yeah. down and put in the fireplace. <laughs> it's, it's the same history being carried through, yeah. you know, it's... The seed is still going, yeah, that's and exactly. and that's what's made it so powerful for me being here. That there's a it's a genuine thing. The, the concept that we talk about in architecture often is the palimpsest, and that's the layering up of history, uh, especially in terms of when uh, you know post war is a good example because after the war, the the rubble and the 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 lost, if you like, the destroyed forms the the bottom layer, mm -hmm. and then you start to rebuild, but yeah. those layers are maintained. And this yeah, is a perfect yeah. palimpsest, yeah. you know. This was reconstructed, the people themselves are part yeah. of that layer. Yeah, so the facades may be fake, yeah. in a way, but the, this whole area is real. This is real life, this is the real Rotterdam. This is, and this is what I want people to understand. And I mean, yeah, you can go to Rotterdam like everybody does now and go to see the Markt Hall and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the new icons. <laughs> okay, you can do that. <laughs> but I'd rather let you see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I came back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, so I we briefly mentioned that there was the large scale, the urban plan, the, the amazing kind of every... You know, I think there's there's something you notice obviously that the the corners of this of the housing uh, kind of volumes here they curve. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe his thinking was to do with this kind of natural flow of people, this that's inviting it. curve. People would it's people friendly in every way. Yeah, that's no it. No sharp edges, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. You have the geometry, but you have in essential places you have the rounded shapes, and you have them where people meet. So you have this, the streets, you should, yeah, you should do a shot of the street. Have you done that? Yeah. yeah. But um, um, 
you have this central street, this axis through this area, and then here um, at the square, there's these two rounded corners where you had two shops, you had two corner shops. And the idea of a corner shop, I love the idea of a corner shop. And we had them everywhere in Rotterdam, we had corner shops, they're all no longer there. People live there now, or, but they, they were the places where you met. So it's the place where two, it's like a crossroad, you know, it's the place. Where, and then if you round the corner, it's this very natural flow to meeting yeah. and to... Where the two worlds meet. It's where the two worlds meet. And he, everywhere where there's rounded corners, there is an anomaly in this, uh, there is a warehouse or, a, or the, the, the boiler... Um, I don't know how you call that, the water boiler shop. Um, the, yeah, and, um, and also um, they had, uh, the shops have this, this uh, huge awning. This, oh, it's not huge, it's, uh, how do you say, white awning. So that you could, when it rains, you could just stand there with your pram, with your little one in it and talk to your neighbor. And, and it's also how everybody would know what was going on? I mean, sometimes nowadays you hear about people who've like that in their apartments for 10 years. There's been a few cases lately. It would never happen in an area like this. Right. Never, because everybody would know she hasn't been at the water borders for uh, two days. So what's happening to her? And they, So people, poor as they were, would look after each other, look out for each other. Um, and in the way that he designed, or the you know even the people of this movement designed, it was through the architecture that they were able to create you know opportunities or, or a healthy community. Yeah. So you know, like you're describing how the because of the way in which the the public squares are arranged and these shop corners are yeah. arranged, you actually allow for a you know improved lifestyle. Yeah. People will will uh, will will have a much more healthy social life and community life. Yeah. It just shows you the power of, of architecture yeah, and spatial uh, yeah, design. That, that's it. That's it. That, that's, that's what I want people to understand. That architecture is not about pretty or ugly or about stones or mortar or bricks. It's about, it's like, it's also social fabric. <laughs> and uh, that's what you, can, what you can use it for. And yeah, that's, I, you know what? I have a lot of, uh, do a lot of tours where you, um, guide architecture uh, architecture students mm -hmm. and um, I know that if you're young and I had the same thing myself and also you, you want to be recognized you know mm -hmm. you want to be able to build something that everybody will like and you know you have these big dreams and um, preferably become famous and be written about in the magazines and stuff we, we call it the star architect the star architect yeah. exactly but that's I mean it's natural yeah. But with age comes this understanding that you're really lucky if you become happy in <laughs> what you do. <laughs> it's, if it's fulfilling and if you're happy, <laughs> that's uh, so... Um, yeah, wisdom yeah. there to, to think of about. Wisdom, yeah. And I think yeah. we were talking about earlier that if you're so focused on the brand or the image or the end product, if yeah. you like, I think those people who really rose up, most of the people who really got up to the prompt to the prominence and they've lived throughout history and designed and you know started movements and all these things they weren't that focused on the end product of no. i want to be famous or i want to have no. a, i want to be an icon they were more focused on the process yeah. they were more focused on the the reasoning and the cause and the, yeah. the actual uh, the actual essence of why and what they're doing yeah. so uh, i definitely uh, on the same wavelength that you know it's not that we're looking to create some sort of you know iconic uh, movement if you like but it's more that if you focus on what you think is important it could become yeah. something that's but you need to keep it so close to yourself be true to what be true to who you are and 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 to your to to, to your own values yeah otherwise it doesn't it, it'll never happen I, i'm sure it will never happen or you'll become very successful, but very unhappy. They're very unhappy, yeah. Oh, we know there's plenty yeah. of those people as well. Hopefully we don't be them. Um, so in it, actually, that was the thing I was saying, is that when you have that urban plan, you see the level of kind of thought put into that design template, that, that, that kind of oh, master plan. Uh, everything is thought about. And this is the kind of, uh, you know, the beautiful thing about functionalism is the level of thought put into certain aspects of uh, how you think people will experience and use the space. 
But what I wanted to come on to next is actually what I loved about the style of movement in architecture with all these people, even Rietveld uh, and Aud, is that same philosophy spread into the small scale, yeah. to the door handles, to the joinery, yeah. to the way in which you go up the stairs. Yeah. And it's that kind of, uh, I was reading about Aud and he called it the pure functionalism. And it was this idea that uh, the scientific or the kind of rational cost-effective construction techniques uh, was reconciled with the psychological needs of people. Yeah. And obviously that's how you would define functionalist design, but the level of bespokeness you yeah. see walking through these places to me is, I mean, I, it's, it's my, mind yeah. I know, I know it's uh, but it's my, uh, also my, uh, if, it, if I was to pick a style, I would choose the style. Yeah, of me too. And, and, it's, and it's, so, it's, it's so minimal. And yet there is so much happening. There's so much go, going on. But everything in this house, is the, every, every square centimeter is designed and everything is thought about. And everything, with everything comes, comes um, thinking about, hmm, how would people who live here use it? Yeah. Where would they put, put their clothes? You know, as if they thought of every... Of, of every aspect of their daily life and how they could make it easier for the oh they won't have money to uh, buy wallpaper let's put a, make a picture wheel and so they won't have to wallpaper so much and let's give them this basic wallpaper so they can use that if they want to they don't need new one or all the fixed in cabinets and everything is it's um, it's incredible and I saw these the, the features in the Ritbull house which is probably you know, one of the best examples of, of the kind of bespoke elements yeah. uh, going from the scale of the entire house all the way down to, yeah. you know, the, the, the metal pipe that yeah. comes up and is used as a speakerphone or, or, you know, even, you know, it's almost as if they were sat there drawing and, and, and living the life through the drawing as, as they were drawing it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think in terms of the design process as well, architects can tend to forget that essence when you sit there and you draw your plans in, in, in your practice or you draw your sections you almost forget to live to visualize i think it's a skill for a designer i don't know if you'd agree to 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 be able to empathize with the life of everyone and anyone i think that's part of what you yeah. learn as a designer that when you envision a cup or you envision uh, a chair or even if you envision a house yeah what is the what is the kind of the most nuanced aspects of how someone would use that thing yeah. would they grab it with the with the middle part of their left thumb yes. or will they grab it with the the edge of their left thumb and 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 grip it with three fingers yeah. or two fingers and that informs the sculpture or the or the, or the design of the thing and you really sense that in the, the, the large scale master plan behind you yeah. all the way down to the the house and then the room, and then even the 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 the, the ornaments of the doors and the keys and whatnot. So, to me, that was incredibly powerful, and uh, I think that would be part of the star movement, right? Uh, that is, I think, that in itself is more part of the fun the functionist movement, the right. Nieuwe Bauer movement. Right. All this, oh sorry, all this eye for detail, mm -hmm. everything from, and also. Um, uh, I'm trying to see how I can use the word the right words because I have the Dutch words in my mind. But what you said about the like the microcosmos versus the um, the yeah. microcosmos microcosmos that on every scale yeah. you do from the whole complex the whole structure down to the details yeah. you use the same um, you put in this same amount of love to get to the yeah that's it yeah that is very typical i think even more perhaps for some of the nieuwe bauer architects than of the style sure okay and you know it's, i think the reason i say uh specifically to the, the style is because i don't think anyone did it better because uh, what you have because I've, I've i've seen modernist examples and i've seen but in terms of Almost like the house is a machine. Yeah, it is a machine. Exactly. Yeah, it's the same like out, yeah, out like uh, outside. He wanted to be able to produce this like the Model T for right. it. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, if you talk about the Rietveld Schroeder house, 
this house was spe specifically built for his mistress. So she was his mistress. So he, he had a wife and children, Rietveld, and, he, and she was his mistress, and she understood him as an artist. So mm -hmm. that's what she all, they always kept together. Eventually, they even married. And he designed the house for her. And then he came to her, lived with her, worked with her while he still had his own family. But that was their, their, that was their project. Mm -hmm. And I think they are also the only people who could live in this house because this everything is adapted to them, to them. And this is the house that symbolizes that uh, symbolizes their love for each other. So the Rietveld Schroeder house is something mm -hmm. um, special, special, you know? Yes. You know, I have a question. And it's a very important question for what I'm researching as well at the moment. Uh, and I'm still looking for an answer uh, that kind of makes, I'm still kind of researching what I think would be the answer. And it's, we've been talking about this, uh, the benefits of having a, a kind of repetitive uh, style or repetitive design template. And this is the kind of mass produced functionalist, uh, you know, you know, uh, style or, or movement like we see with these houses. Uh, you know, you describe the Model T thing, the Ford. It, similarly, what I was kind of wondering is we're as concerned with the, uh, with the individual needs of the users, but Surely there's a kind of clash that if you would make everything the same, yes. but everybody has different needs, yes. how does it work? And I think yeah. that's why our studio is looking at adaptability. Yeah, that's exactly, that's what I wanted to say. Then, then adaptability. So does this work for that, do you reckon? This in itself or? I think, uh, yeah, I think it could work. I mean, one clear example of it working is the fact that uh, he, he designed this so that all the all the houses were connected so we got a, a, a massive adaptation already which was yeah. they they doubled the floor plan well the, for so they they did the two varieties so one was they two houses became one and there is another version where one house got an extension at the back uh -huh. so there's three different varieties three different sizes so this is the thing I was kind of trying to trying to understand currently in my design studio is how do you create something uh, which allows for a vernacular, which allows for yeah. organic, uh, you know, the organic growth of the community and their communal needs, yeah. but also create a system that works for yeah. the many. It's a difficult question. Yeah, it's a difficult <laughs> question. And I think, yeah, yeah, it's really difficult. And I, I know... Well, a da typ typical Dutch example for this is that then, um, when Dutch architects try to build a row of houses, and they try to make them all slightly different because that appeals to people because then they look like the canal houses in Amsterdam, you know. And then um, they have this idea about how, what you can do with your garden. So there is, it's not like this, that everything is exactly the same, but there is this format in which you can do things. Now what happens is that, especially at the back of the houses, people all started putting up a fence. That's so Dutch. We don't want communal outside spaces. We want our own garden with fences. So when, then a few years later, you see pictures of these houses with all these different sort of fences and all these this different, different kind of furniture and plants. And, so, and they want to, a lot of architects want to control that. Mm -hmm. But it is the essence of what people want. They want to have their own private back garden and they don't want to be overlooked by other people. So what people want and need, <laughs> what architects find aesthetically uh, attractive, can be two completely different things. So I, think, I, I guess that... You, have, you also have to be able to let it go as an architect. Just let it go. You provided them with the with the structure, with the canvas, and now it's theirs. You have no... Let them do this. And you, you will also see it when you walk around here. Some people have put up like really fancy old-fashioned curtains and all the, um, you know, the china dogs and things in the window. And let them do it. It's their house. And... Here, you cannot paint your front door. In the old situation, for instance, some people had put in 
like sort of a farm door, <laughs> things like that. You cannot do that. So that's, but what you do at the back of your house and so give them, yeah, I would say give them in their own private space everything that they, every freedom to do what they want to do. And maybe from the, the street side, I mean, that's communal. That's, so that may be different. I don't know if that's the solution. No, that makes a lot of sense because what you're, what you're saying is actually the, the people will be less concerned with the artistic side of things. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care. I mean, some people might, but yeah. in, in, gen in general, people will care about how they live in yeah. this space, right? It's, it's almost as if you're saying, put the ar give the architect's responsibility, uh, give the architect the responsibility of being in charge of the aesthetic, but they also provide the template and the kind of the yeah. opportunity for, for an interior kind of adaptability. Yeah. But in essence, the people can evolve yeah. and adapt the yeah. interior. And that's exactly why I think that most architects, when you study, you want to have private clients who give you, who totally understand you as a creator and give you all the freedom so that you can do your thing. You're not designing your own house, you're designing their yeah. house or their environment. And um, I think that's a really nice challenge in designing complete neighborhoods then. Yeah, well, you know, at the end of the day, in uh, at least I know in the UK, I'm not that knowledgeable in other countries, planning permission once you get your house built you're you're allowed to adapt it whatever you want on the inside yeah. you can smash down any walls you want as long as they're not load bearing and then you yeah. can uh, do what you want so in essence this already exists but it's not a easy thing to do or cost efficient thing yeah. to do given that there may be ways of for example the red valve house where you can yeah. slide a door uh, you can create a whole new room just yeah. by the push of a hand or a, you know a sliding panel so perhaps there is this uh, there is some solution in, in, in the idea that uh, the artistic aspect can be controlled and systemized by the architect but the the, the the let's say the inside or the the threshold within has to be obviously yeah. it has to be yeah, maneuverable yeah. anyway yeah. but you know the thing that kind of begs the question is if if that was to expand so let's say people want to later down the line make these houses bigger or they want to connect you know i keep saying that what i've learned today i've I'm, i honestly have learned today that just by connecting the houses, you can you can allow for an adaptability yeah. of growth, but the adaptability of growth further than that is a question I'm I'm actually looking at. Yeah, but I've, there are experiments. Some experiments have been going on, and or not even experiments. It's just what they've done in some places in Rotterdam. I mean, I'm not an architect, so I don't look at this from techn technical point of view. But I know that um, there are um, there are certain areas where you had the opportunity, for instance, to, um, it, it was a sort of, com yeah, sort of, uh, oh, how do you call this, a complex like this, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you had the opportunity to buy a house and then you could decide I want only two, f two floors, for instance, because I can get a mortgage for three floors now, so maybe later I can add an extra floor. Or I can add an, or you have, um, for instance, um, a part at the back, an extension at the back where you can put an... So thinking in a sort of building blocks where you can add and extend and stack, that's a logical thing to do. And the only thing you have to do is make sure that you can have a connective door or, or staircase or, or whatever to connect the thing. But that's going on already. Yeah. But maybe that's a Dutch thing. I don't yeah. know. Could that be a Dutch thing? Well, in this the, this is what I've been thinking, and it's 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 the way of thinking that that Aud had. It's the way of thinking that I think I'm starting to understand of the the star movement in architecture that allowed for a functionalism that did not dehumanize yeah. things. So it was functional, scientific, rational, responding to human behavior and movement, whatever. But you know, I think today people have started to make that very dehumanizing thing. And I think technology plays a part in that. But at its core, functionalism is 
quite a humanistic thing. Yeah. And this is a kind of realization I'm having. And yeah, you may, are. Maybe somebody listening to this is saying, oh, of course, what's wrong with you? <laughs> uh, you know, my tutor often, uh, I have good debates with him, but um, no, I think I'm starting to understand because I, I think, like I said earlier, it's often that functionalism is given this, uh, uh, people are thinking functionalism is a means to control the masses yeah. because you have these kind of repetitive things. Yeah. But Repetition in itself is not bad. Outside the repetition, for instance, of the yellow windows where you can see where one house ends and the next house begins, you know, yeah. that it added to the feeling of community. We're all part of it. So it's not about the shape. It's never about the shape alone or the technique alone. Or the, It's always about the, in, the intention behind it, the reason why. Um, and you can, with a different intention, you can put the same things, uh, the same um, area you see here in another country in another time with another type of um, society and it can be, ooh, it can be so scary. Yeah. So it's the combination of, of everything. It's so, so true. I, I think, I think, it, I think th these ideas were inherently part of, 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 his, of his work, in my opinion, because it feels as if for me, when you focus so much on the on the specific use of you know the, the most intimate ways people can use, I mean, I mean, just looking to the right here, that why does that cupboard only have one? I don't know. Is that a mistake, or do you think that was in the one? Just one knob to pull. Yeah, but that's that that's because that's part that's of the how design. the door works. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I that would look odd today because. Yeah. Now you would put two, yeah. uh, you know, door handles, to, uh, sorry, handles to, for the cupboard. Yeah. But then you think, actually, wait, majority of people are right-handed. So they would open that with the right side, maybe. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> They'd open it. But then the way in which this cupboard would work is you've already opened one door. So you, you can just from the back side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe very rarely people will open a cupboard boom like this. I don't think many people do that because then you get it in your face. Exactly. <laughs> you stand to one side and you open it. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that level of detail shows me that they had these incredibly kind of humanistic ideas from the start. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I won't go in. I think it's another episode to talk about what functionalism can, has kind of given way to in a negative way as well. Yeah. But I kind of wanted this to be an episode to show that there are hugely positive aspects. Yeah, and we're, we're, that we're talking now only about this interbellum period, yes. this right after the second, because Out himself evolved as well, and he started using ornament again and mm -hmm. using brick again oh, and wow. going back to the yeah, because he was. But but you know, it everything happened so fast and the. the the idea that this would change the world for the better, and then ten years later you get the crash, and you get the nationalism and the, the whole f awful things happening in um, in Germany, yeah. and then the, the the war period, and and then Stalin, and, and so all there they had so thought that this was the way forward, and then they discovered that there was it all had a backside, and there was a darker side to this, and this could be interpreted in other ways. So, yeah, but this... Just shows how fluid the style, styles are in a way. I mean, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because the Stalinist and the kind of the Nazi regime was, was, uh, was bringing back the classical style yeah. of building because I believe they, they, they saw that as a way to, to, to kind of project that kind of Roman Empire-like yes. feel that exactly. we have the power. But this was because it was a radical and new thing. They hated it. They, they, they had, that's I always thought that this and artists are art. It's also what I, yeah. The, the the it's funny because I talked about the, about this this morning at the exhibition. Right. There was a picture by Max Beckmann, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. German painter who fled to Holland uh, during the war, and and I was talking to this group about and artists are art. This had nothing to do with shape. The, 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 I'm, I'm positive. It wasn't that he hated the shape or the, the way it was painted, or he hated the fact that this were, were progressive thinking, yes. radical f uh, f uh, thinking, free spirits who wanted to change the world. And the best way to do that is to demonize them and, you know, put them down and make them. This prioritized people. 
Yes. Yeah, and they and didn't want what, to prioritize. That people. I think is what was at the bottom of, um, and and you see it every. <laughs> if you ask people, why do you hate modern, mm. mo modern architecture, modern art, everything that's modern so much? It's usually the people who are really afraid of changes of. Mm of something new of a few so what they do is they go back to the past and and idealize um a past that was i mean how can you idealize the 19th century when you know how people slaved in factories and 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 you know the the the, the mortality rates and uh, and how uh, you know the, all the cholera epidemics and all the things how can you think but it's a sort, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. I think what we'll end with is, what would you like to convey if you were to able to convey a message to masses? I know I don't to have that many followers, oh, I know. <laughs> but I don't have that many followers. But I'm saying if you were to have that kind of pedestal to say why you're passionate about this, why you do what you do, why you wake up and you come here and you try to, at an individual scale, person by person by person, how many individuals you speak to today and in some ways influence society. And you know, essentially that's how we met, you know, we met through a, a tour and, and I was incredibly inspired by you and, and now I've decided to project your message across. <laughs> what would you say? Yeah, what would I say? That's that's quite a good guy. Let me think for a minute. Hmm. Depends, I think, on who I would say it to. I um I would say the people you would say it to are a new generation of designers. People who are looking for inspiration, people who are looking to respect, understand where we've come from but also they want to take new ideas forward and they want to prioritize people and humans and their needs. Well, the first, this, it, what I would say consists of a few things. The first is it doesn't have to happen now. You have, you know, you have all the time in the world. You, it, does, it doesn't need to happen within the next 10 years or something. So... For some it will take 10 years and for some it will take 60 years. So just let it happen, let it go. Uh, and enjoy the process as much as the result, even, even more than the result. And also don't be afraid to just, um, once you feel this is not for me and it doesn't make me happy and it doesn't feel good, just quit doing it and start doing something else. That's what I would say. And just experience life in the world and talk to people. Go out and enjoy, understand what real life is about. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's not so difficult, actually. I don't have any, like, big theoretical design no. type. <laughs> Just, I'm looking, I'm looking, yeah. That's inspiring. Try to be, yeah. <laughs> try to be the person you want to be. And um, From other designers as well, I'm hearing... Very similar things. You do? Yeah, of course. <laughs> we spoke to a, a, an incredible uh, kind of architect called Chris Hildry last uh, last episode, and um, he said very similar thing that you've got to be true to yourself as a designer. If you're doing something you don't believe in, or if you're doing something that isn't kind of what you're passionate about, uh, you can end up in a place you don't want to be, and you yeah. could end up. I don't think there's much progress to be made there. And I think people often feel the pressure yeah. that they need to do something, maybe fit into a particular style or a movement yeah. or a, a group of people. But the designer is only a human being. So everything we just said applies to, to everybody. To everything. Yeah. yeah. yeah be true to yourself. Yeah. But it, I think the people can get distracted in design and yeah. think that they have to be true to something else. But... It's also a kind of nervousness of coming up with your own ideas. Yeah. But it's not, do you think it's necessarily a negative thing to, to come up with completely new ideas now? Um, what's new? I mean, uh, what is new? Is it something you um, try hard to think of? Oh, I need to be original. If it's, uh, 
if there's pressure to be to do something original, you get really disappointed because everything has been done and everybody has been thought of. of. And I think what's new is what we're doing now. We're coming to a new. To, so start sharing to because that's the only way to find something that's really new, a new experience or a new way of talking or a new. And and don't be afraid to to change your opinion about something, and you can take ch change it. 20 times a day, who cares? Who cares? I change my opinion. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. I'm constantly changing my opinion. My, my opinion is just a point in time where, where I place it like this, okay, this is my opinion, and then I can again start looking at it from different sides, and okay, let's change it again, so. That's really beautiful. I think that's, that's a perfect way to end this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything else you want to say or... No, we've said so much. I've loved, I've loved this because it kind of, it, the, I think the underlying notion that we we're kind of looking at was this idea of the new, you know, the style, yeah. these new things. Because I think that's what I was going for, especially because there's a lot of negative connotations to some of the things associated with functionalism and, and, and what we think of functionalist architects. But I wanted to take the positives. Yeah. But I also wanted to see that as we're in an era where people want to do new things all the time. And these people, you know, the, the modernists before were coming up with new things. Can I add something? Because I just thought of something. Please. I would really urge people to uh, look, look back, to sometimes just stand still and look back to the past and discover what's already been done and because there's you know you have it as an as a designer you make all these sketches and there's one you take and that's the way to go forward you know and the rest you leave behind wouldn't it be great if you could travel back in time visit the studio of someone like out rummage through all his castaway picture um, sketches and go on from there because life is so short and you can only do but wouldn't it be good if we could just doesn't New doesn't have to be new in that it is created now. New can also be a new approach to something already existing or to another combination of things. That's what I learned at art school. Originality doesn't exist. It is your personal approach to the, to the world. And, and, and you use the set, 10 same ingredients that somebody else uses. But what you do is different. Than what the other person did. That's that's originality. It's about all, all about the context in the brain and the connections and the similarities and the, you know, it's your personal approach. That is what makes it original. Wow. Even though it. Yeah. That's what we saw with yeah. with Aud. And, and you know, it could be that Mr. Someone like Aud, uh, uh, ninety years ago, was having this the conversation, conversation. conversation we're having, and that's what I like. I, I like to believe that. Um, and and we're going on, like we're, we're we're standing on the shoulders of Jack. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's beautiful.